we are really good at picking up friends as we go along. So I am, I'm going to trust that other friends will still find us this morning. Brave people on the front row. I'd love to begin with uh, an announcement in case you're in the wrong spot this morning. Uh, we are going to continue our study of 1 Corinthians all, until we get to chapter 16. This is, this is where we are. Um, but if you were looking for the study this morning, uh, looking back at, the, um, at the, the ripple effects of the Seminex controversy, the split in our seminary, the, the battle for the Bible, they once called it, um, that's happening in room 115 right across from the water fountains up there. Uh, I, I poked my head in. They have about 15 in there right now, but there's still room for you. So I will not have my feelings hurt if you stand up and say, uh, that's actually where I meant to be this morning. But if you stay here, all the better, because we, uh, we will have a, a great time digging into 1 Corinthians chapter 12 this morning. Could we start with prayer requests, though? Thanks for sharing that, Nicole. John, say it one more time. Stephanie? Thanks, Stephanie. David. I'm looking forward to it. It was good to see so many friends in purple over the past couple of days at the LWML convention. So uh, it's, it's always nice to see them here too. Well, we celebrate LWML Sunday every second Sunday. So we'll get to hear about the, the mission and the work. And if, you, if, you'll, if you'll indulge me, I'll pray for the LWML at large this morning too. Did I miss anyone's hand? Okay, let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, you call us your own. You call us to be students of your word. You call us to be fervent in prayer. And so help us answer that call this morning, that we would worship together as those who have been called and claimed for your kingdom, that we would devote ourselves to your word just as your word calls us to, and that we would be fervent in prayer in this moment and throughout our lives. Help us to lift up those needs that we're aware of and, and to also reach out with thanksgiving as we do for Katie. Um, as she's still in this battle with cancer, we, we recognize that, uh, that you have continued to show signs of your mercy and grace. So thank you for her strength that in this latest round of chemo, you provided her uh, enough fortitude to forge forward with, uh, with grace, with peace, with, with the ability to continue to, to connect with others, to keep her spirits high as she continues this fight. We ask that you please bless all those who traveled here to Edmond for the uh, District LWML Convention to, to give them safely back to their destinations, to allow them uh, beautiful moments of worship this morning. And we praise you that uh, our friend June is able to be a part of our gathering too. Bless her trip with safety and bless the mission of the LWML that others might see the work that they're doing, that others might join with them in prayer and in giving, but in ultimately that they might join their hands in service as well, continuing to extend the reach of your kingdom through your servants here on earth. We pray for Lindley, for all those who hurt, but especially a little girl uh, with a broken wrist after falling off the slide. Lord, we ask for, for healing and for comfort, for, for discipline, as she doesn't use that, that wrist for a while. But we ask, Lord, that you'd put her back together just as your love puts each one of us back together. And we pray for conflicts in places far from us, too, especially after the attack on Israel and uh, the ongoing war in Gaza, we, we ask, Lord, 
We ask, Lord, for peace. The same Jesus who on Easter evening stood among his disciples to speak peace to them, we ask that he would speak peace for these who, who don't yet believe and belong to him, among Jews, among Muslims, among unbelievers in our own country too. We ask, Lord, that you would be that ultimate peace that stills troubled hearts, that finds reconciliation with brothers and sisters, and puts our world back in order. We ask, Lord Jesus, that our lives would be ordered by your word that we would take these words seriously, and that your great gospel truth would guide our hearts all our days. We pray in Jesus, our Savior. Amen. I, uh, I promise I'm not ripping uh, Pastor Benai off, but he's going to have, if, he, if you came to early service, you've already done this exercise. If you're coming to late service, then you will do this exercise. I have a phrase I need you to complete the last word of that phrase, and, and now you get to be part of it. So I was, I was your guinea pig before, uh, now this is for you, misery loves, oh good, misery loves company. There's a question on your handout that you're going to discuss at your tables. When do you desire to be with other people most? The axiom would say probably when you're miserable, but you might have a different answer to that. And then there's a more specific second question, when or why do you desire to be with other Christians most? The first question is just when do you not want to be alone? But when specifically in that second question, do you desire the fellowship of other Christians? Go ahead and take a moment to share at your tables. Okay, a quick unscientific poll. Now some of you might have really struggled with this. There's one table that stopped talking early. Um, if that's, maybe it's because that table does not desire to spend time with people all full stop. Maybe it's because they can't get enough of people and the answer is all the time, but uh, just a uh, uh, show of hands. Who desires company during the good times? 
Who said they desired company the most during the hard times? Less. Yeah. We we're told misery loves company, um, but, but it's funny. Um, I think as Christians, we don't share the hard times quite as much as maybe we're even called to. We keep some of those hurts and hardships quiet to ourselves. I met with somebody just this week who, in my opinion, should be on our prayer list, and they asked me specifically to not include them. Um, even though what they're going through, just, just some simple medical issue that would, would look very similar to the other things that we pray about among this Christian congregation, they said, no, nah, it's not for me. Um, we sometimes have a hard time sharing those things which are difficult for us. Um, and uh, even as we say misery loves company, uh, uh, we don't always put that into practice. Um, I'm going to tell you when I desire company the most, um, especially Christian company, and that's on Sunday morning. Um, I've, I've been other places other than worship on a Sunday morning, and it feels weird. Um, I've been here on Sunday morning, and, and people aren't here, and that feels weird. Um, I, I desire a full house on Sunday morning. There's no, there's no better place and time for me to see a bunch of faces. And this is speaking as an introvert, somebody who doesn't need constant social interaction, who looks forward that not every day is Sunday morning. Uh, there are other days during the week that doesn't have to be um, um, full blast uh, um, social activities, but I need it today. This would not be the same um, without you. Worship is not the same without you. Easter Sunday is a blast, but the people who come the week after Easter, that, those are my people. And so I'm so excited to have you and your hearts in Bible class this morning as Paul starts to answer a new question. We've spent five weeks answering the question, can you eat meat sacrificed to idols? Uh, he's done with that. And I don't know if the church in Corinth would say that he, they felt he sufficiently answered that question. Even as he spends four chapters answering that, he basically said, use your best judgment. <laughs> but not on just on that, but on any number of things. So again, he hit on all kinds of topics. Like he talked about head coverings, and he talked about paying your pastor, and he talked about the Lord's Supper, all to get at that one question. He's going to start a new one today. And maybe it's a simpler question, or maybe he could just think of fewer examples, because it only takes him three chapters to answer this question, but it doesn't mean it's, not le it's, it's less important in any way. This is a question about spiritual gifts, and I would say that he does a pretty good job, especially that he does not run away from this emphasis right at the beginning that you cannot have a conversation about spiritual gifts and ignore the Holy Spirit. You can't separate these two things from one another. But it feels like, as Paul writes this down, there's, there's certain flags. If you're in the ESV the way I am, um, uh, there's a footnote even that the editors left in there. So if you look at chapter 12, verse 1, it starts with these four words, at least in my edition, now concerning spiritual gifts, and the footnote says, the expression now concerning introduces a reply to a question in the Corinthians letter. See also these other places where he's used that same formula. So as he introduces this question about spiritual gifts, Paul's first lesson is don't talk about spiritual gifts absent talking about the Holy Spirit. There is a giver of these gifts. There is a Lord of these gifts. There is a source of these gifts. And you shouldn't just look at the manifestations of that. Don't just look at the, the fruit of the Spirit without acknowledging also the Spirit at work too. And so uh, because the Holy Spirit's my favorite, uh, I really love that Paul makes sure, not just somewhere in the, th the three chapters, but right up front acknowledges the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. So there's a question on your sheet right in the center of that first column that I have for this room this morning. What questions do you have about the Holy Spirit and his gifts? Lewis. Okay. So 
to, to ask the question about spiritual gifts is to, to sort of ask a question about my own awareness. How do I identify the spiritual gifts I've been given? Good question. Anybody else? Questions about the Holy Spirit or his gifts? Okay. The, the determination we're going to hear very clearly in this chapter, there is not a single person, absent Jesus Christ, who is given the whole range of the Spirit's gifts. And so who gets what? And in what measure, right? Um, it's a good question to ask too. Any other questions about the Holy Spirit or his gifts? It's a room full of Lutherans who understand the Holy Spirit perfectly. <laughs> Guys, there are other Christian traditions, I've, I've met them, who say that, that Lutherans don't believe in the Holy Spirit. Um, even though we can stand up and confess the Apostles' Creed that says, I believe in the Holy Spirit, and then we quickly move on to say, and the Holy Christian Church and the communion of saints and the forgiveness of sins. We spend such little time on balance in our creeds talking about the Holy Spirit. We, we make sure he's in there, but we don't talk about him much, um, and we don't dwell on his gifts the way other Christian traditions too. Uh, there are many ways to approach a Bible study on the book of 1 Corinthians. And I've been, uh, I've been checking in with, uh, with a Bible teacher I really appreciate. Um, he's not Lutheran. And his Bible study spent six weeks on this one chapter. We're going to spend one. He's charismatic. <laughs> so the, the work of the Holy Spirit and the gifts that become manifest in the lives of believers, get a different emphasis if you're in a different Christian tradition. I don't think it makes it any less true. It's just not going to be a point of emphasis for us. That, that whole thing where we split off and talked about the Lord's Supper for a whole session, just half of chapter 11 um, last week, that got like five minutes in his Bible class. Um, uh, again, it's in there. Uh, as we read through this book, we can't ignore that this topic is addressed but other people are going to pour a lot more time and attention than we are in here, too. Um, uh, Hope's got a question here. Sure. You're very sweet to talk about uh, the gift of hospitality. I agree, that is a spiritual gift. I don't know that the gift of interior decorating is necessarily a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Hospitality can also be manifest the way you were over the weekend saying hello to strangers at an LWML conference. Um, hospitality, making people feel welcome and at home. Um, especially when they're off their home turf and you're here in Edmond, um, I think that's a, that's a great gift too. That requires no idea, you don't have to learn how to match colors uh, or, or pick out the right fabrics. Uh, there you go, you wear purple and you say, glad you're here. Pam's hand was up too. Hmm. Right. Mm. Yeah. Um, that's it. I'm going to give you an oversimplified answer because I, I, I've experienced the same thing that you're touching on. Um, and this is not the point of the, 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 the text this morning. But, uh, but when the question comes up is, what are my spiritual gifts and how do I identify those? Um, I, think that, uh, I think that the wrong answer is, look deep inside yourself. Find out those things that give you joy and, uh, and lean into those areas that you have self-identified as areas of strength for you. Um, I think that the way the Holy Spirit works most commonly 
Um, I don't say, and we will talk about this today, is how the Holy Spirit works. I think the way he works most commonly is when he speaks to you outside of you, through God's word. He is not asking you to look deep within. He's asking you to listen to this time-tested word. He speaks to you through your pastor. He speaks to you through Christian brothers and sisters. I would say that there's a better chance that God is identifying, God the Holy Spirit is identifying your spiritual gifts when he calls you to serve, when he calls you up and says, there's this moment where we could use help with hospitality. And it's not an accident that I dialed the 10 digits that get me your number. That he's at work and things like that. That I would tell young people, uh, especially the young people that I've met with to talk about the ministry, um, it's not a self-call to be a DCE, to be a deaconess, to be a pastor, to be a missionary, to be a Lutheran school teacher. But when you have so many people in your life saying, have you thought about this? The Holy Spirit is calling you to sort of consider even these gifts I am reluctant to acknowledge within myself. He is keeps trying to shine a spotlight on, so I can't ignore them anymore. So it's a, it's a tough thing, but I would say the most reliable place we get our uh, spiritual gifts identified is when, uh, by the power of the Holy Spirit, God speaks to us through others, through his word, through the preaching of the gospel, uh, through the mutual conversation and consolation of the saints is the, is the good uh, 16th century uh, Lutheran term for that, but through Christian conversation. But let's dig into this. We're going to read verses 1 through 3 and then take a pause because this is where Paul makes sure that the Holy Spirit is front and center when we discuss spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, again meaning believers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols. You can mentally underline the word mute, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. He draws the distinction between gods that are not gods, these mute idols, as in they stay silent. And through the spirit of the living God, the one true God, he doesn't stay silent. He's the one through whom Christians confess Jesus. You cannot believe in Jesus without the power of the Holy Spirit. The, uh, the third article uh, of the Apostles' Creed, the explanation by pastor of the past, Martin Luther says, I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ my Lord. I can't believe it. It's too good for me to believe. It's too long ago for me to believe. There are too many hurdles in my contemporary existence for me to believe, unless the Holy Spirit sort of opens the door and clears the way and makes sure the gospel gets to my heart. So in this situation, he's saying, your mute idols do nothing, and yet if you meet anyone who speaks Jesus is Lord, you're actually hearing the words of the Holy Spirit, which is why I lean so heavily on this Christian conversation bit. When somebody comes by and stops in my office, whether they're here to give me advice or they're there looking for mine, I know I'm going to hear the Holy Spirit because they are a temple of the Holy Spirit, and nobody confessed, nobody says they belong to Holy Trinity Lutheran Church or St. Paul's Methodist Church or any other Christian church unless it's the Holy Spirit who's alive and at work in them. And so I've got great access to God the Holy Spirit by just having a conversation with my Christian sister or my Christian brother. And I can't ignore that. There's this misconception, even among Christians, right, that the Holy Spirit is kind of wild, does whatever he wants, sort of shows up, moves in mysterious ways. Uh, people will, uh, uh, will fall out in the Spirit, start speaking in tongues that the Holy Spirit is God's agent of chaos. And maybe that's the picture we get on Pentecost, right? That's the big feast day of the Holy Spirit. And, and a lot of this is, is read. You, you see uh, the Holy Spirit descend like fire on the, the, the disciples who, um, if I'm if I'm guessing culturally, probably spoke maybe two languages. 
They probably spoke Aramaic. That's the language of, of, of their people, their, their culture. They probably spoke Greek um, because of the, the influence of the occupying Roman armies and, and the predominant culture. They did not speak every language under the sun. This is not the, the kind of highly educated group that learns to speak 30 languages when they're little kids. And yet, the gift of Pentecost is that the very languages of all the people who were, happened to be present in Jerusalem for this festival of Pentecost spontaneously gets spoken by the disciples. And I think that's where we get the focus on the Holy Spirit being kind of wild and taking things in new directions, and you can't ever predict what the Spirit's going to do next. But if you're listening to Paul, Paul who was not participating in Pentecost, Paul who only later comes to faith in Jesus Christ, and you apply this principle where he says no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the power of the Holy Spirit, I think it's exactly the opposite of chaos on Pentecost. The Lord Jesus Christ sees lives out of order as these uh, faithful Jews come from all over the known world to participate in these solemn religious rituals, and yet they do so in such a disordered way that their life is not anchored in the reality of the death and resurrection of their Messiah. They're still worshiping the God of the Old Testament without recognizing that he has fulfilled his promises in Christ Jesus. And so to bring chaos back into order, the Holy Spirit sends the message of the gospel where these people can hear it. It's, it's ordering these disordered lives around Jesus, their center, is what's actually happening. And so again, different Christians emphasize this differently, that you've got the, 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 the strain of, of, of Christianity, which is still Christianity, but, but leans on the Holy Spirit doing these uh, unpredictable maneuvers, and, uh, and you sort of can't contain the Holy Spirit. And the truth is, no, you're a human. You can't contain the Holy Spirit. Uh, you can get in his way, and I think we do that quite often, um, but the Holy Spirit is not some rogue agent of chaos. In fact, from the very beginning, the Spirit is hovering over the deep to be God's agent of order, to bring order to the chaos, especially in the chaos of disbelief where you could attach your life and hope to anything. It's the Spirit who says, it's Jesus who's Lord. Anchor yourself right there. So there's the discussion of speaking in tongues that I've brought up this morning and that comes up in this chapter. So I want to suggest, um, again, this is for your bottom square on the left side. I want to suggest that there's three ways to think about speaking in tongues. Um, one is the contemporary uh, uh, charismatic Pentecostal um, approach to speaking in tongues where there's this spontaneous moment where at the height of some sort of uh, religious um, um, swelling up, I'm able to, to speak in a language I've never learned. Often it sounds like nonsense to other people. It's, it's just a, a, a gibberish mishmash of, of syllables that, that don't resemble anything that, uh, that I'm able to interpret. But the idea is that um, when you're speaking to God, he understands this language. It's not for uh, humans to hear, um, but it is, is simply for a divine audience. Um, that's probably the, the one of the three that, that I like the least. Um, it's, it's common, um, and I cannot say um, with full Christian certainty that, that what's going on is not from the Holy Spirit, but that's not where I see him most reliably uh, uh, giving the gift of tongues. There is people who have the, the gift of different languages. That the word tongue in, uh, in Greek, the word glossa, uh, like the word glossary in the back of your, uh, uh, your, your textbook, uh, can mean language. So speaking in tongues can also faithfully be rendered speaking in languages. We use that same, you talk about somebody from another country's mother tongue, uh, their mother language, it means the same thing. So speaking in tongues could mean somebody who has the gift of being able to study and appreciate and then put to work other languages. Um, that's a gift that I have to work really hard at. Other people, it comes more naturally. Just like any sort of gift that you have, there is a gift of people 
uh, who, can, who can adapt to other languages and then, because they're Christian people, um, share the word of God in those languages too. Earlier this week, I was on the phone with, um, with a, a, a stranger um, who has a connection, who has a connection, who has a connection to our congregation. And he was calling because um, Pastor Meyer had set him up to come preach on Pentecost here. And then he said, and I reached out to Pastor Meyer and I couldn't get him. And I said, yeah, there's a reason for that. He said, um, but, uh, but I needed to call because I can't be here on Pentecost. Uh, he works for Lutheran Bible Translators and he um, is deploying to Cameroon, a country in, in Africa, to do work on the ground in, in learning this language, and then in being part of this culture and learning this language. I mean, he's a white guy from Missouri. And uh, uh, to, to really absorb this, uh, it really takes that kind of that cultural saturation. He's going to go there and be there for three years. He says, if you've got any openings on Pentecost 2027, I'm all yours. Um, but he's going to go there and then use that moment to equip himself with the skills that it'll take to adapt the Bible into a language it's never been published or printed in before. Um, I don't have that gift. That's incredible. Uh, he's taking his wife, a deaconess, and they're going to work on this project together. Um, that's a gift of the Holy Spirit. That someone in a place in the world where no one has yet proclaimed Jesus is Lord in that language will, because I am convinced that God's word never returns empty. And so as the work of training uh, uh, this pastor and his deaconess wife uh, in this new language and, and culture, the, the act of, of, of taking God's word and making it accessible to, uh, to a group of people who've never had the scriptures in their own language before, that's a gift, a gift of God's spirit working in his people. I'd say that's, that's probably one of my favorite uh, ways of thinking about speaking in tongues. Um, the last one is simply in Christians confessing Christ to one another and to the world. Remember, no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the power of the Holy Spirit, which means you're not in control of this tongue. When you are sharing Jesus with your wife, when you are sharing Jesus with your unbelieving co-worker, when you are sharing Jesus to your kids, when you are sharing Jesus to your neighbor, you're speaking in tongues. <laughs> the Lord has sent his Holy Spirit that you might be able to confess something that on your own you could not even believe or grasp. Um, you've done a lot more speaking in tongues than I think you want to realize. It's not all about the great big moment of, of really showy speaking in tongues that you see in movies or maybe on a, a TV televangelist. That every single time you tell somebody, Jesus loves you, you have spoken with the tongue of the Holy Spirit. And that's not you. That's the Holy Spirit working through you. So as I put that all out on the table, let's look at uh, verses 4 through 11. Because as Hope and Lewis have both prepped us, there are a variety of these spiritual gifts. Verse 4, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Again, circle that line, because we'll have to come back to verse 7. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the spirit of utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same spirit. To another faith by the same spirit. To another gifts of healing by the same spirit. To another the working of miracles. To another prophecy. To another the ability to distinguish between spirits. To another various kinds of tongues. To another the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. You need to know that this is just one listing Paul gives of the gifts of the Spirit. And in three of his other letters, he has a list. And in no, none of these four lists together are the list exactly the same. So as you hear this list of, of prophecy and wisdom and and faith and healing and miracles 
and tongues. Don't think that this is somehow the one exhaustive list. Paul himself doesn't stick to this list every time he presents this. Um, so it makes me wonder like why this is here. One, this might be a reflection of what he knows, the, the gifts that are present in the Corinthian church. And so he uses these gifts because he's writing to specific people. And so he can use this list of gifts because he knows that the people there have these gifts. That might not mean that your church has the same gifts that the church in Corinth had. Uh, you, your church might have other gifts. There is a spiritual gift of hospitality. That is also scriptural. It's not in his Corinthians list, though. We're told uh, that the fruits of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Is that in here? Not all of that. Maybe not even some of that. He's going to spend the whole next chapter talking about love, which is the chief of the fruits of the Spirit. So Paul is not saying that in one place uh, this, is, this is the fruit of the Spirit, in other places uh, 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 that's no longer the fruit of the Spirit, that this is the fruit of the Spirit. It's actually so, so varied that it's hard to nail it down to one complete comprehensive list. So, um, so I say that so a contemporary church in 2024 doesn't say... Well, now we take this list and we look among ourselves and find who has the gift of miracles and who has the gift of prophecy. Because it says it in the Bible that the, the Spirit has given these gifts and so they all must be present here. This, again, is not his one list that he sticks to. So this might be very specific to the Corinthian situation. It also might just serve his sermon illustration the best. Um, I can get up and offer a sermon and, and talk about... Um, uh, certain reasons people experience grief. It's not always grief over um, the death of a loved one. We can grieve other things too. And I might give a list, but that doesn't mean that was an exhaustive list, that I cover every single example of grief. Sometimes it just serves the rhetorical purposes to, to stick to three and be able to unpack those. Now, in this situation, that could also be what Paul's up to. He could... Uh, go ahead and list all the spiritual gifts he lists in other places too. But to make his rhetorical point, he keeps the list to this. It's all possible. All I'm saying is don't take this as saying, okay, now we use our Christian decoder ring and say, who in here has these gifts? Because Paul says he, he gave them to the church. Um, uh, you, can, you can take that as examples, but not an exhaustive list of the Spirit's gifts. But it tells us what the Holy Spirit's up to. If you notice healing, the Holy Spirit, who gives these gifts, is up to something. If you go talk to a Christian brother or sister, and, they walk, and, and you leave feeling like, boy, I encountered real wisdom there. Wisdom that, that I didn't have before. They shared with me. That's the Holy Spirit. He's up to something in that moment. If you have uh, the gift of tongues, we talked about that, the Holy Spirit is up to something. Knowledge, faith, miracles, the whole thing describes ways we see the Holy Spirit working. Again, not to bring chaos, but often to bring the things that are chaotic and broken back together, back in order. These gifts of faith and healing and knowledge and wisdom aren't to let the world run wild, it's to anchor us Back in Jesus Christ, the one we know and trust to be the ultimate reality and the ultimate good for us and for the whole world. So do spiritual gifts, especially the ones like the ones listed here, do spiritual gifts exist today? Let the Holy Spirit loosen your tongues up, guys. Okay. Yes. Do they exist exactly like it says in 1 Corinthians? That's the, that's the answer I would give to. Lewis, you're brave. Um, the answer is, I can't say they don't. I can't say they always do. So the truth is that there's often two camps on this. And um, you can, this is a theology nerd moment. Uh, so if, you, if you're one of those, this is for you. Um, there's, there's a group that calls themselves continuationalists, continuationalists, or maybe they don't even call themselves that, but, but their theology lines up where other people can label them continuationalists, meaning 
that if these gifts of the Spirit were given to God's church in the earliest days, um, then they have continued into this present day. That the gifts of the Spirit to, to prophesy, to cast out demons, to, to heal the sick, to, uh, to perform miracles, to speak in tongues and wisdom and faith and all the rest of that stuff, if that is present in the, the first generation of the church, it's present in our generation of the church. And then there are others um, who've been labeled cessationalists, not sensationalists, uh, cessationalists, meaning to end, that the, the gifts of the Spirit um, were there in the days of the early church. This is, this is the contention. Because, um, well, for in large measure, the canon of Holy Scripture hadn't been finished yet. In the, in the days of Paul, that, uh, that there is no book of 1 Corinthians that he's drawing from. But at some point, the New Testament canon of 27 books is finished, which we would say is by the Holy Spirit's inspiration. The Spirit has spoken his eternal word through the, the hands of different writers and made sure that it is preserved and shared with you and me and eventually people in Cameroon. That this is how the Holy Spirit speaks now. And now with the word of God sort of cover to cover complete, these gifts have stopped. The gifts of prophecy, well, when you have God's prophetic word in his timeless text, do you need spontaneous prophecy in 2024? Aren't there enough good promises in his, in his word to look forward to that you don't need bonus stuff? And, you, and those, that same group would say, use God's word as a litmus test to judge those who today claim to have these gifts of prophecy, which they contend ended with the canonization of Holy Scripture. And I'd say I agree with them both to some degree. Um, our, our God is in the business of giving gifts. And I don't see him taken back very much. It would be really strange for our God to give his church this gift and to take it back. Now, not every congregation represents God's whole church. The gifts of his church, I believe, exist worldwide. All believers are a part of this church. And so you might have to look far and wide to find the person out there doing miracles today in the name of the Holy Spirit. But I can't tell you that they're over and done with. I also agree with the other side that says, we do have Holy Scripture, and we do use that as the yardstick for those who today claim to speak words of prophecy. That we sort of receive even words of contemporary prophecy with some note of skepticism. And that's a, that's a negative sounding word. But that we would, we would follow the, the Bible's call to, to test those spirits, to, to, to use scripture as a way to, to judge those. And so I sit right there on the fence, both sides, could come and give me their best pitch for why they're right. And I would have to say, yes, I agree with you up to a point on both sides. And you'll meet Christians who are all in on one or the other. And as... You don't see the... Share with me. What don't you see the point of, Curtis? Okay. If I'm going to repeat Curtis's question, you tell me if I you tell me if I if I misunderstand this. He says, "Why is this a debate? Why do we why 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 am I taking time to, to talk about this? And why why does this become a differentiator among among Christians?" He said, "Every child is a gift, um, and uh, every every child has has different uh, gifts and abilities. Uh, I would say that some of these they're talking about natural abilities, but some of them they're talking about supernatural spiritual abilities. Um, you have Christian traditions who say that there are two kinds of baptism, Curtis. There's baptism by the water and baptism by the spirit. And you're not really in until you've... D uh... Guys, I, I had somebody in my office who told me that they've been Christian their entire life. And they could tell me about all of this 
baptism by the Holy Spirit stuff. And they said, but do you know what we never heard growing up? Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For it's by grace that you've been saved through faith, not by works, that nobody can boast. They never heard that. They were told that they knew they were saved, not because Jesus died for them, but because they had this moment where they spoke in tongues and, and really were able to demonstrate that the Holy Spirit dwelled within them because of what happened. And that makes it really hard when there's a whole camp of Christians who say, that doesn't even happen anymore. What you're doing is just some sort of show, some charade, some sham. And so you've got people on this side who says, those people aren't even really Christians. And these people are saying, well, you're not Christian until you do this. And so it becomes this, this unfortunate divide among God's church altogether. This misunderstanding of spiritual gifts. And I wish it wasn't. I wish it wasn't a debate. But some use this as the hallmark to know whether you're in Christ church or not. That this is how you know if you're saved. And if you do these things, which we say have stopped 1,600 years ago, it's how you know that that's not the Holy Spirit, that's some evil spirit who's now possessed you and doing this other thing. It becomes a differentiator in Christ's church for, for that reason. I, and that's why I sort of uh, uh, think it's important to mention, because other Christians, some of them dwell on this quite heavily. Some of them make this the linchpin of their faith, the way we make the cross and our connection to the cross through baptism, the linchpin of ours. So, where is the Holy Spirit's work seen most clearly? I'm taught that not only that I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him, but the Holy Spirit calls me by the gospel, enlightens me with his gifts, sanctifies and keeps me in the one true faith, just as he calls gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth and keeps it with Christ in the one true faith. If you want to see the Holy Spirit at work, show up as he gathers believers together. This doesn't happen without the Holy Spirit. Worship on Easter or the Sunday after Easter or on the Wednesday in between the Sunday after Easter and this Sunday, that's as the Holy Spirit is doing his work. He's gathering his church together. Because you are meant to share this together. Mi misery loves company. But there is nothing that the church needs more than company. Because on our own, believers don't have this full complement of the Spirit's gifts. We're just limited creatures. And the Spirit is unlimited God. And so listen to the rest of this chapter, which is going to be by far the most familiar thing we've covered in weeks. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, starting at verse 12. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, all made to drink of one spirit. Again, we get our emphasis of baptism, and we see it show up even in a discussion like this of the Holy Spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if an ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, but that doesn't really make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye can't say to the hand, I don't need you. Nor again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts don't require. But God has so composed the body, given greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there might be no division in the body. But that the members might have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you, now y'all, are the body of Christ. And individually members of it. 
And God has appointed to the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administration, and various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? No. Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? No. But earnestly desire the higher gifts, and I will show you a still more excellent way. This is a picture of the body at work. I like that he explains the theology first and then goes to the metaphor. Uh, They teach you in sermon school that you start with the metaphor and then you sort of unpack it. Here, he wanted to tell you first that members of Christ's church are variously gifted with gifts of the Spirit, and then he attaches it to the metaphor of the body, that you need every eye, ear, hand, and that you can't imagine that you were meant to function on your own. Misery loves company. The church needs company. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, by the gift of your Holy Spirit, we can confess your truth before this world, including in front of one another. So as you love and encourage each one of us, I pray that your Holy Spirit would be at work in such a way that we would hear your name proclaimed, that we would see faith grow, and that As we acknowledge the gifts of your spirit, we might encourage one another. Not in rivalry to imagine one gift is superior to another or one gift makes the other one redundant or unnecessary. But to recognize that you have made this body exactly the way you want it. That just like each one of us bear your image that together, and it's only together, that we are meant as your church to bear the image of Christ who suffered and died for us. We ask, Lord Jesus, that the Spirit would be present in our hearts, in our words, and in our gathering together. In Jesus we pray. Amen. Thanks, guys.